Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. How old are you? If you're between 35 and 45, then here is a question you've probably asked yourself more than once. Will I be alive in 1975? According to Equitable Life Assurance Society's figures, since 1910 there's been a decided increase in the proportion of our population made up of men and women who've reached their 65th year. To be exact, the increase amounted to 68%. So the longer you live, the better your chance becomes of living longer and the more likely it is that you will be alive in 75. And in exactly 15 minutes, we'll have a suggestion which will show you how life insurance with the Equitable Life Assurance Society can help you make the most of this long life that's ahead of you. Tonight's FBI file, Death in the Desert. Eighteen months have passed since the end of World War II. But there is still a war going on in the United States. A vicious, sustained battle in which the decent people of the nation are pitted against unscrupulous criminals. Criminals who man an army of six million. It may not have occurred to you that there were six million persons with arrest records in the nation, but it is a fact. Out of every 22 people, and that includes our men, women, and children, there is one person who has been convicted of a crime. That fact concerns you because in almost every crime, you are the victim. You, the decent, law-abiding citizen. Tonight's file opens in a remote section of desert country in one of our southwestern states. A young photographer, Cliff Douglas, and his wife are walking slowly across the wasteland. It is twilight. Cliff, look. There's our tent. Yes. Oh, I must say it looks pretty good. You tired, honey? Uh, yeah, kind of. Well, we shouldn't have hiked so far, I guess. Oh, I loved it. I think we got some pretty good pictures today. Yes. I'm dying to see how those shots on the mesa turned out. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, where are those rolls of film? I have them right here. Oh, good. Well, give me your hand, honey. Okay. Uh, <laughs> there. Home at last. Oh, yes. Hungry, Cliff? Starved. <laughs> well, you start a fire. I'll go down to the spring and get some water. All <laughs> right. What'll it be tonight? Beans or beans? Oh, I don't care. Surprise me. 
Hey, uh, uh, where's that precious wood? Right beside the car. Oh. John! Wait, come here, quickly. What is it? Come here to the spring. What's the matter, honey? Look, slip. That man there in the ground. Hey. He's bleeding badly. Yeah. Well, Cliff? He, he's still alive. What can we do? Oh, there's a bullet wound in his chest. Cliff, shouldn't we take him to a doctor? Well, honey, we're not exactly around the corner from a hospital. Um, uh, let me wash his wound. Take a look at it. I'll wet the scar. There. Uh, thanks. Wonder who he is. How it happened. I don't know. From the looks of that wound, we may never get the answer. <laughs> In the town of Jasper, some 50 miles away from this desert camping ground, FBI Special Agent Jim Taylor is just entering the office of the local sheriff. Pull up a chair, Mr. Taylor. All right, thanks, Sheriff. You made good time getting down here. Well, I started out as soon as we received your call. Oh, any new developments in the case? No, I'm sorry to say there aren't. Well, Sheriff, I wonder if you'd mind reviewing the facts for me. I didn't get many details. Well, suppose I start right from the beginning. Oh, that'd be fine. At 12.30 this afternoon, three armed men entered the First National Bank here in Jasper. Mm -hmm. They took 12000 in cash. When a teller named Flynn attempted to send out an alarm, one of the men shot and wounded him. I see. The shot was heard on the street and a crowd gathered. When the bandits left the bank, they couldn't get to the getaway car and they were forced to separate. Well, what happened then? Well, there was quite a bit of shooting. One of the bandits was definitely wounded while driving away in a stolen car. Uh -huh. How about the other two? As far as I know, they were unharmed. And what reports have you had on them since, sir? Nothing at all. Did you set up roadblocks? Yes, we have all that completely covered. Uh, well, let's see. It's a little over six hours now since the robbery occurred. That's right. We're not too disappointed, though. Oh? Well, you see, time has a different meaning out here. The criminals have plenty of wide open country to roam in, and catching up with them is a matter of days, not hours. I understand. I'm well, sure if the bandits still have the money, I suppose. As far as we know, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, excuse me. Certainly. Hello? Hello, Sheriff. This is Tom Wayne. Oh, yes, Tom. A stolen car used by one of the bandits was just found out on Route 42. Near where? A little over six miles past Newton's Corner. Be right out there, Tom. <laughs> More bandage, Cliff? No, this should do it. How is he? Well, I've just about stopped the bleeding, but I'm afraid he's in pretty bad shape. Oh. Joan, you were right. I think we should take him to a doctor. Where? Well, Jasper's the nearest town. That's about 50 miles from here. Yeah, I know. Think you can find your way there at night? Oh, sure. Oh, coyote? Yes. Now, let's see how we're going to move this fellow to the car. You ain't moving him. Huh? What? He's staying right where he is. Who are you? His brother. He's badly wounded. He needs a doctor. Yeah. I, I was just going to take him into Jasper. I know. I heard you talking about it. Well? He still stays here. Oh, but you... Shut up. Look, mister, don't... Shut up, both of you. Cliff, he has a gun. That's right. Who put on this bandage? I did. When would you find him? Less than an hour ago. How do you come to be here? Well... We're on a camping trip. Oh. Hand me that wet cloth, lady. He needs more than that. I know. Well, then why don't you Wait. take him... I think he stopped breathing. Johnny. Johnny! He has stopped breathing. He's dead. Yeah. Cliff, I don't want to stay here any longer. Let, let's go away, please. Okay, dear. Wait a minute. Well? You're not going any place. You're staying here. The car's right over here, Jim. Driven right into a ditch, huh? Yeah, evidently on purpose. My deputy tells me the car was out of gas. Oh? You see all right, Jim? Yes. I have my own flashlight here. Oh, good. Here we are. Sheriff, 
car's already been gone over for fingerprints? Yes, we got some pretty good impressions. Oh, fine. I'll send them right on to our laboratory. <sighs> Plenty of blood stains on this front seat. No? Oh. You must have been pretty badly wounded. You know, Sheriff, from the descriptions you've got on these three bandits, I'm almost certain that they're the Prescott brothers. You say they're wanted for another bank job up north? That's right. We've been looking for them for over three months now. Well, when I was driving this car, it couldn't have gone very far. Sheriff, does anyone live around here? No, this is just plain desert country. Oh, and there's plenty of places for him to hide. Yeah, plenty of ways for us to find him. Hmm? I'd rather he was out here than sticking on the road. You going to start looking tonight? No, we'll wait till morning. I'll organize a posse as soon as it gets light. Sheriff, what if he did stay on the road and tried to commandeer another car? Well, we still have our roadblock. Now, I'll get the local radio station to send out an alarm warning motorists to beware of anyone walking the highway. Yeah? Yeah? Your office calling on your car radio. Oh, thank you. Come on, Jim. What? It may be word on one of the other two bandits. I sure hope so. I told my office to contact me out here if anything came in. Here we are. Sheriff Winslow. Hello, Sheriff. Word just came in from up near Crockettsville. A man named Camel was assaulted. One of his horses stolen. Could be one of the bandits did the job. And did this happen at Camel's home? Yes, sir. Now we'll drive over and see him. Yes, honey. I'm cold. I'll get your coat. Hey, where are you going? To my car. Sit down. My wife is cold. I want to get her a coat. Sit down, I said. Sit down, Chris, please. Okay. Look, will you tell me why you're keeping us here? We're waiting for someone. Who? My brother. Your brother's dead. This is another one. Why would you be meeting him in a forsaken spot like this? Because we got separated today. We made it up. We got separated. We'd all meet here by the spring. Yeah, but what's that got to do with... Shut up. Somebody's coming on a horse. Flatten out, both of you. Down, I said. Ed. Was that you, Buck? Yeah. Johnny get here? Yeah, he got here. Oh, good. Not so good. Johnny's dead. Huh? There's his body. Oh, I seen him get shot when he grabbed that car. I didn't know that. Who are those two? I found them here. Where'd they come from? We're from down in Hastings. My wife and I are on a camping trip. That your car? Yes. Oh, that's a break. Ed. Yeah? Where's the money? Oh, I haven't got it. What? I gave it to Johnny. He was bringing it here. I see no sign of it around. Hey, what is this? I'm telling you, Ed. Wait a minute. When did these two get here? Before you, Buck? Yeah. They found Johnny? Yeah. And then they also found a dog. Look, mister... What'd you do with it? I, I don't know what you're talking about. A bag holding $12,000. Now, let's have it. We ain't got much time. I didn't see any money. You're lying. He's telling the truth. Keep out of this. <laughs> Why, you... Let go of me. All right, hold him, Buck. He's going to get a workout until he tells us what he did with that dough. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI helps provide security for your country. Now let's talk briefly about security for those who want to be independent as they grow older. Now, <laughs> hold on a minute, Mr. Cross. You must be talking to men who don't have families to support. I can't save a cent on my salary. Taxes, food, rent, clothes. Well, people who talk about saving for independence these days ought to have their heads examined. No, you're wrong. Thousands of men, many of them earning much less than you, are looking forward to complete independence in their 60s through an Equitable Life Assurance Society Independent 60s Plan. Well, I still think it sounds a little too good to be true, but... Go on, I'm listening. The Independent 60s plan of the Equitable Life Assurance Society has these three features. First, it costs considerably less than you probably think, especially if you're covered by Social Security. Second, you can create your retirement estate for the full amount the moment you sign the contract. 
You don't need to spend years wondering whether or not you're going to accumulate enough money to be independent in your 60s. You're sure of it because it's guaranteed by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Third, this equitable plan gives you a definite goal and provides you with a method for reaching that goal. Yes, there's nothing finer than being independent in your 60s, being your own boss, able to do the things you've always wanted to do. Well, now you're talking my language. Then I suggest that you get in touch with an Equitable Life Assurance Society representative. He'll give you the facts on the independent 60s plan and let you make up your own mind. Look in your phone book for the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I... T-A-B-L-E. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, Death in the Desert. The social basis for human relationship in the world today is the family. And in ordinary conditions, human beings have no greater loyalties than to the members of their own family. But in the criminal, that is not an ordinary human thing. For his very means of livelihood depend on his constant violation of everyday conventions. As you can see in tonight's case from the files of your FBI... One of the basic tenets which he violates is that family loyalty comes second to personal possession. For your average criminal is motivated by only one thing, one quality he has in common with those of his fellows who live by the sweat of other people's brows. That common quality is greed. <laughs> Tonight's file continues at the desert oasis. A half hour has passed. Young Cliff Douglas has been severely beaten by the brutal bank bandits. He's lying unconscious on the ground. His wife is bending over him. Cliff. Cliff, oh, you poor darling, poor, poor darling. Joan. Yes, dear. Joan, where are you? I'm right here, Cliff, right beside you. Thank heaven. Well, it's come too, huh? Yes. Okay, get away from him. Well, you're not going to start again. Get away. Oh, look, tough guy. Now shut up and listen to me. I'm, I'm not... Oh. Now listen to me. Something you ought to know about that money you took. I grabbed it from a bank. I shot a guy who tried to stop us. I'm only telling you this so you'll know that I'm playing for keeps. I tell you, I, I didn't see any dough. Oh, Buck. Yeah? What are you doing? Digging a grave for Johnny. We'll make it a big one. You're getting two more customers. Please, you've got to believe us. We don't know anything about the money. I've been listening that long enough. Now, uh, who wants it first? Well? Look, do anything you want with me. Leave her alone. Is, uh, that how you'd like it? Yes. Okay. And she gets it first. Oh. Ed! Ed! Yeah? What? Look. Look, I found it. I found the bag with the dough. Oh, well, where was it? I found it when I was digging. Johnny must have buried it oh. before he passed out. Uh -huh. yeah, it looks like it's all here. All right, let's not waste no more time. I'd better get moving. Okay. We'll use their car. Come on, you get up. Just just take the car. We need cover. Somebody to front. You two are coming with us. No. Now, look, get into that car. We're heading south. Mr. Campbell, do you feel well enough now to answer a few questions? Yes, I, I guess so, Mr. Taylor. Oh, that's fine. Now, will you tell us about the assault, please? Well, I, I was out on the back porch when I heard the horses start to fret down in the corral. Oh, yes, go on. I, I went down there, and I found a fellow just starting to saddle one of them. Mm -hmm. I, I, I grappled with him, and, and then he hit me with what could have been the butt end of a gun. Can you describe the man? Well, he was pretty tall, as... About six, two or three, and he had 
light-colored hair, if I remember. That sounds like one of the bandits, all right. Yes. Well, Mr. Campbell, your wife said she heard the fight and came out just in time to see this man right over the hill in back of your ranch. Is there a road back there? Well, that's more of a trail, Mr. Taylor. It crosses a section of the desert. Well, I'm familiar with it, Jim. Oh? Huh? It goes past Lone Spring, then hooks up with Route 55 down below. I see. Can we drive a car over, Sheriff? Yes. Well, this man has about a two-hour start on us, but he's on horseback. Now, if he stays with the trail, do you think we could catch him before he reaches the other highway? Yes, I think we could. Then let's go. Yes, honey. How much longer do you think this will go on? I don't know. Hey, what are you two talking about? Oh. My wife was wondering how much longer we had to put up with this. No kidding. Look, we've been driving for over two hours now. You must be out of danger. Why don't you get out and leave us alone? Just drive south and keep quiet. Where are we going? To Hastings. That's where we live. I know. You already told me. Why are you going there? <laughs> me and Buck are going to live with you. This is Sheriff Winslow. Come in. Come in, headquarters. Yes, Sheriff. Tom, we're out here by Lone Spring. Yes. We just found the body of one of the bandits, the one who was wounded. Yes. We also found a stolen horse. He was a bandit near here. We believe the other two men are now in a car heading south into Route 55. Well, we haven't got a roadblock set up that far down. I'll notify the authorities down there. Tell them to watch out for him. We're going to look around here a while, and I'll be in touch with you later. All right. Jim. Yes, sir. You examine the body? Yeah. It's one of the Prescott brothers, all right. I just alerted the police south of here to be on the lookout for the other two. Well, Sheriff, there may be more than two in that car. Well, what do you mean? Well, I found evidence that there was a woman here. And possibly another man. Really? What kind of evidence? Well, the dead man's wound was bandaged with a woman's scarf. Mm -hmm. I also found some female heel prints around the ground. I see. There'd been a tent pitched here recently, too. I found the stake marks. Oh. And here's what may be a real clue, Sheriff. I picked it up down by the spring. What is it? An undeveloped roll of film. A roll of film? That's right. Sheriff, let's head back to your office. I think we've got some work to do. Sheriff. Oh, come in, Jim. Thanks. Well, any news? No, they evidently got the jump on us last night. Oh? They must have gotten to Route 55 before we alerted the police down there. I've just come from the camera shop. Yes? I had that roll of film developed. I got enlargements on each print. I have them here. Oh, good. Now, these first two are of the same woman. Here. You by any chance recognize her, Sheriff? No, I'm afraid I don't. She could be the woman who was at Lone Spring last night. Now, here's a couple of shots of a cottage. That look like any place around here? Uh, no, I've never seen it. Well, half the roll was shot around this cottage, the other half in the desert. I got the impression from the pictures that this place was the woman's home. I see. Now, this one's a long shot of the cottage. The hills in the background. Hey, wait a minute. Hmm? Let me look at that one. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I know those hills. Really? Yes, the three cone-shaped tops. They're down in Hastings. Hastings? That's a small town about 100 miles south of here. Sheriff, I think we'd better get down there at once. Oh, well, Buck. Yeah? Pass me them potatoes. You mean you're eating more? I like potatoes. Hey, you want some? No, thanks. What's the matter? You didn't eat anything. I'm not hungry. Your husband don't eat either. Well, how can we with you around? Oh, now, look, don't start that smart talk again. Buck, hand me some bread. Here. Yeah. You know, I think we're going to stay here a real long time. <laughs> well, this girl can really cook. Wait a minute. Well, don't you want me to answer it? 
Yeah, yeah, you can answer it. People must know you're home, but just watch what you say, that's all. Sure. Hello? Mr. Douglas? Yes? This is the police. I want you to pretend I'm your neighbor. Well, sure, George. Are the Prescott brothers there in your house? Yeah. We're just eating dinner. They're armed, I imagine. Yes. There's an FBI agent outside your dining room window. He's watching you right now. I see. When we finish talking and you hang up, I want you to count to 20. One, two, three, that tempo. Uh Uh-huh. The FBI man will be counting with you. Okay. When you reach 20, grab your wife and throw her to the floor. We'll do the rest. Well, that's fine, George. Thanks. Goodbye, Mr. Douglas. Goodbye. Yeah, what did George want? Oh, just neighbor talk. Joan? Yes, dear? Your beads are all tangled. Here, let me straight... Oh, golly, look what I did. I'll pick them up. Well, I'll help you. Down, honey! What? What? Where are those guns going? Are you kidding? Oh, oh. Now, put up your hands. Go on, both of you. I'll get their guns. Thanks, Mr. Douglas. Well, are you two all right? Oh, yes. Thank you. Now I'll take your unwelcome boarders out of here. Ed Prescott and his brother were tried for their crimes and sentenced to serve 20 years apiece in a federal penitentiary. In ending the criminal careers of the Prescott brothers, your FBI once again proved the point that crime does not pay. But in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, the point was proven in an unconventional manner. Because this case was not resolved because of a clue left by the criminal through any mistake. This was a case that was resolved because a special agent, working on every available angle found an innocent-looking roll of undeveloped film. No clue is too unpromising to follow to the very end. And because of that, this case was closed. It's quite true that the eyes of justice are blindfolded. But crime will never pay because justice has friends. Friends like the special agents of your FBI, who see very well. just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. A little while ago, I gave you a few brief facts about the independent 60s plan of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. To get full information, you'll want to ask your Equitable Society representative questions like these. Exactly how much will the plan cost me? The Equitable Man has the answer. How will it dovetail with my Social Security? He's got the answer to that, too. What income will it give me in my 60s? Your Equitable Society representative will give you the exact figure. Ask him to drop around tomorrow for a friendly visit. Find him in the phone book or send a postcard, care of this station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Old Lady Larceny. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation 
Old Lady Larceny on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Every now and then, yourselves this question. Will I be alive in 1975? Well, you know what tremendous advances medical science has made in the last generation. One result is that the percentage of men and women over 65 years of age is now two-thirds larger than it was in 1910. Twenty-five years from now, the percentage will undoubtedly be even larger. So, no question about it. The chances are good you will be alive in 75. And in exactly 15 minutes, we'll have a suggestion which will show you how life insurance with the Equitable Life Assurance Society can help you make the most of this long life that's ahead of you. Tonight's FBI file, Old Lady Larceny. <laughs> There are certain incontrovertible facts about which no well-informed person can argue. Facts which are accepted to be as valid as the truth that the atomic bomb is deadly. But there are other facts which are equally true, which are not accepted. And for the most part, they concern people. There are currently some two billion people in the world. And despite what some would have you believe, the accident of geography has nothing to do with whether or not they are good people or evil ones. For no person anywhere in the world is composed exclusively of good qualities or bad. Everyone has a capacity for both. In some, the good is paramount, and public-spirited citizens are the result. Others give way to evil, and criminals are born. But because the two basic possibilities are present in everyone, good and evil do not have two different appearances. You cannot judge a person by how he looks to you. The safest thing to do is always to remember that the meanest man in the world may sing the sweetest song, and often does. <laughs> Tonight's FBI file opens in Los Angeles, California. Emmy Lake, an elderly white-haired lady, is seated in the living room of her modest apartment, which is located in the residential section of the city. She is busily knitting as the front door opens. Is that you, Paul? Yes, Emmy. Uh, I'm in the living room, dear. Oh. <laughs> you know, I was just hoping you'd come home early today. There's a movie at the Tivoli that I'm so anxious to see. <laughs> it's Van Johnson. Mm -hmm. And there's one of those cartoons that you like playing there, too. You know, that one with the rabbit in it? Uh, you do like that rabbit, don't you? I, I guess so. Paul, don't you feel well? Huh? Well, you look so down in the mouth. Is something wrong, dear? Yes, Emmy. Well, what is it? I've been fired. What? Mr. Sutter said my services were no longer required. Why, why that can't be. What, what happened, dear? He said that I was too old. My hand was too shaky. That's ridiculous. He said he was getting a younger man to do the job. Well, I, I never heard of such a thing. Why, Paul, you're the best forger in the business. He doesn't seem to think so. Well, I do. There isn't a man in the entire profession that can handle a pen like you do. 
Thank you, Emmy. I mean it. Well, for land's sake, you've done nothing else for the past 30 years. I know. That's why it's pretty hard to take. Well, I, I'm not going to stand for it. What can you do? Well, I can have a talk with Mr. Sutter. Oh, now, Emmy, what's done is done. Oh. Let it be. I will not. I'm going over to his hotel to see him right now. Please. Now, now, now don't you argue with me. Uh, just hand me my shawl. <laughs> In the Los Angeles field office of the FBI, Special Agent Jim Taylor is busy working at his desk. Oh, Jim. Oh, yes, Ned. I'm going out for some lunch. You care to join me? No, thanks. I've got to write up this report. What are you working on? Well, I guess you might call it a continued story. Hmm? An old friend has come home to roost. Really? Who? All I can call him is Mr. X. He's a check passer. He's turned up periodically here in town for a couple of years now. Well, haven't you got anything on him at all? No, he's a pretty clever boy. No, oh, I've gotten his description a dozen times, but he has no distinguishing features that set him apart from any one of a thousand honest businessmen. Hmm. What's his technique? He works hotels, uses legitimate credit cards. His forged checks have the signature of the real owner of the card. Well, what does he get these cards? Oh, I understand they can be purchased by the dozen from pickpockets who in turn have lifted them from the owner. How large are the checks? Never more than $100, and that's what makes it tough. These small operations are always the hardest to track down. Is that check there his most recent effort? Mm-hmm. That's it. What about fingerprints, Jim? Well, the ones that I've sent to Washington in the past have been treated with fumes, but so many people had handled the checks, it was impossible to get any clear prints. I see. I'm sending this one on to the laboratory now. Well, maybe we'll have better luck this time. I hope so. Well, I'd better get down to lunch. Can I bring you up anything, Jim? Yes. The man who's passing these checks. <laughs> Mrs. Lake. Oh, just a minute. Well, hello there, Remy. Hello, Mr. Souter. Come on in. Thank you. Well, say, I haven't seen you in a long time. Mm, I know. Sit down, won't you? Uh, thanks. I suppose you've come here to talk about Paul, huh? Yes. He told you what happened? Indeed he did. And, Mr. Sir, I think that it was a wicked thing for you to do. Now, Emmy, I want you to hear my side of it. I have a business to maintain, Emmy. And unfortunately, in business, there's no sentiment. Well, you certainly have proven that. Well, those last three checks he wrote for me were so bad, I was almost ashamed to pass them. I don't believe it. Emmy, look, his hand shakes like a castanet. Mr. Sutter, even if he forged with his left hand, he'd do better than any of these come lately could with a right. Well, I'm sorry, but I don't agree with don't you. Don't you realize how many years he spent in this profession? Are you aware that one of the first signatures he forged was President McKinley? I know that, Emmy. Well, then he certainly deserves more respect than you gave him today. Look, you're just wasting your time, Emmy. My mind is made up. I have no further use for it. You, you're a cruel man, Mr. Sutherland. Oh, now, Emmy, I think you'd better be running along. Oh, well, very well, but, but I think I should warn you. You're going to regret ever having done this. Paul is going to prove to you that he's better today than he ever was. How's the check passing business, Jim? Oh, hello, Ned. Anything turn up? Something is right now. Oh? This teletype. Looks like it's loaded with information. There we are. Oh, what's the story? Well, that last check I sent to Washington's the one I've been waiting for. Evidently, it wasn't handled too much because there are only a few fingerprints on it. Good. The laboratory has identified one set as belonging to one George Sutter, alias Thomas Sutter, alias Thomas Clay, alias William Clay, alias William Brooks. Well, he's sort of a one-man club. Yeah. What's his record? He's a confidence man, bogus check passer. He's had several convictions. Anything else on him? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it says that he always made Los Angeles his headquarters. Well, you already suspected that. Yes. Teletype also states that in the past he's maintained an account in one of the Los Angeles banks under one of his aliases. Well, if he follows that pattern, it's a definite lead. Yes, I know. I think I'll check with all banks at once. Paul! Yes, 
send me? Uh, where are you? I'm out here in the kitchen. Oh, oh goodness. I, I thought you'd gone out. Yes? You see Mr. Sutter? Yes. What did he say? He talked nonsense. Pure nonsense. I, I'm very provoked with him. And now don't you go getting upset. I made some hot tea. It's right oh. there on the stove. Oh, that's nice. And I set out some of your favorite cookies. Oh, you're a dear. I'll just... Uh, well, Paul, what... What in this world are you doing? You're just experimenting with something. What? You're drawing a picture. Oh, my, what a handsome face. It looks familiar. Who is it? Alexander Hamilton. Well, what in the world are you drawing him for? His picture's on a $10 bill. Oh, Paul, surely you're not trying to counterfeit money. Well, just thought I'd try my hand at it. Well, you just tear that right up. Well, isn't it any good? Well, of course it is, but that isn't the point. I'm not going to have you starting at the bottom in a new business just because of that mean Mr. Sutter. I mean, I got to do something. You're going to stay right in your own line. Now, you give me that picture. Very well. There. What can I do in my own line, Emmy? Well, I gave that a great deal of thought all the way home. Yes? Yeah. And I thought up a way for you to show me that your work is better than it ever was. Tell him. Mm, yeah, I've got a plan. Uh, now, here's what we're going to do. Special Agent Kern. Matt, Jim Taylor. Hello, Jim. I'm around here in Mr. Hood's office. Yeah? I just located a bank account by the name of George Sutter. That's one of the check passers' aliases. Yes, I remember. They gave me an address on him, but I doubt if it's any good. Why? Well, it's over three years old now. The bank tells me that he's been calling there in person every two or three months to pick up his statements. I see. However, I'm going over there and check it anyway. Uh, meanwhile, Ned. Yes? Mr. Hood has assigned you to the case, too. He wants you to go over to the bank. First National. Look over Sutter's account, huh? Okay. After I've checked this address, Evan Sutter, I'll meet you there at the bank. Doing what the mission is, the mission is, la, 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 how did you make out? Oh, fine, just fine. Did you get the money? Yeah, indeed, I did. Look, here, look at it. Goodness. It's an awful lot. Yeah, $5,000. You certainly are a clever woman. Goodness, you're the one who deserves all the credit. Uh, are we all packed? Yes. Good. Where are the bags? They're right over there. You know, Emmy, I've just been reading this travel folder. Uh -huh. Las Vegas must be a beautiful place. Oh, yes, I'm sure we'll have a good time there. I guess we'd better get started, hmm? Uh, well, not yet. I want to make a phone call first. Oh, all right. Oh, I bought you a present on the way home. Really? What is it? One of those lifetime pens. Oh, Emmy, you shouldn't have done that. Nonsense. It's a good investment. Central Hotel. Oh, oh, hello. I'd, I'd like to talk to Mr. George Sutter, please. One moment, please. Uh, I hope he's in. Hello? Uh, hello, Mr. Sutter. Who's this? Uh, this is Emmy Lake. Oh, hello, Emmy. I called to tell you that Paul and I are leaving town. Uh, we're taking a little vacation. Oh, good. Before we go, I thought that you should know one thing. Yeah, what's that? Well, uh, you know how you said that Paul was an old has-been? Yeah. Well, he forged the check the other day that I deposited in my bank. Well? The check cleared today. And the signature was so good that we were able to get $5,000 out of the victim's account. Well, why are you telling me this? Well, call your bank, Mr. Sutter. Huh? You were the victim. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI helps provide security for your country. Now let's talk briefly about another kind of security, 
Security for those who want to be independent as they grow older. <laughs> Listen, Mr. Cross, who are you kidding anyway? My whole salary is eaten up by taxes and current expenses. So when you talk to me about saving for future independence, I say it can't be done. Ah, but it can. Thousands of Equitable Society members whose income is no larger than yours are looking forward to complete independence in their 60s through an Equitable Life Assurance Society Independent 60s plan. Better give me the lowdown on this plan, Mr. Cross. The Independent 60s plan of the Equitable Life Assurance Society has these three features. First, it costs considerably less than you probably think, especially if you're covered by Social Security. Second, you can create your retirement estate for the full amount the moment you sign the contract. You don't spend years wondering whether or not you're going to accumulate enough money to be independent in your 60s. You're sure of it because it's guaranteed by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Third, this equitable plan gives you a definite goal and provides you with a method of reaching that goal. Yes, there's nothing finer than being independent in your 60s, being your own boss, able to do the things you've always wanted to do. You know, I think I ought to look into this plan. Then I suggest that you get in touch with an Equitable Life Assurance Society representative. He'll give you the facts on the independent 60s plan. Look in your phone book for the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, Old Lady Larceny. The Bible, besides being America's best-selling literature, is also a handbook on the proper way to conduct your daily life. For if there is one certain moral to be drawn from tonight's case from the files of your FBI, it is the biblical quote that all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. The swindler who made his illicit livelihood by cashing worthless checks in turn found himself the victim of a similar maneuver. But society has not benefited because one charlatan robbed another. So for your FBI, this case goes on apace. And it will go on until the guilty criminals are arrested and made to realize that the power and the majesty of the law are greater than the power any criminal assumes for himself. Tonight's FBI file continues in downtown Los Angeles in front of the First National Bank. Special Agent Jim Taylor is just parking his car. Hold it, Jim. Oh, hello, Ned. No need for you to get out. I've gotten all the information. Oh, fine. Head off Fifth Street. We've got a stop to make. How'd you make out? Well, I went to the address the bank gave me. As I sort of expected, Mr. Sutter doesn't live there anymore. Uh -huh. In fact, he moved away two years ago. No forwarding address, I imagine. No. No, what happened at the bank? They received a phone call from Sutter just before I arrived there. Really? What about? Checking up on his balance. Huh? It seems they had just cleared a check for $5,000 on his account the day before. Drawn against his account? Yes. <laughs> and this will hand you a laugh. Huh. He was quite upset about it. He claimed that the check was forged. You mean someone turned the tables on him? <laughs> Evidently, yes. <laughs> That's wonderful. Hey, did uh, Sutter say anything about coming into the bank? No, but I've alerted them in case he does. Oh. Did you find out who drew this $5,000 check? Yes, a woman named Emmy Lake. She had an account at the Hillside Bank. What do you mean, had? When Sutter's money cleared, she took it and closed out her account. Oh. Did you get her address? Yes, that's where we're going now. <laughs> Yes, Em. Just look at those mountains. Aren't they beautiful? Yeah. Real majestic. Oh. Uh, what time are we due into Las Vegas? Oh, about now. Oh, it's a pity. I'm enjoying this so. Do you know what it reminds me of, Emmy? What? Our honeymoon. Oh. 
Remember that horse and wagon we stole? Indeed, I do. That little hotel we went up to in the mountains? <laughs> yes. Oh, but greenhorns we were in those days. Paid for everything with cash. <laughs> no, I know. What, what are you writing? I'm just breaking in my new pen. Whose signature is that? The president of the railroad. I copied it off the timetable. Well, what are you going to use it for? Well, we've ordered lunch sent in here, haven't we? You mean you want to sign for it? I was considering it. Oh, no. Don't, Paul. After all, we're on a vacation. Doesn't seem to be anyone home, Ned. No. Wait a minute, there's someone coming down the hall. Uh-huh. Can I help you, gentlemen? Oh, yes. We're looking for a woman named Emmy Lake. I believe that this is her apartment. It was her apartment. They gave it up earlier today. They? She and her husband. They went off, bag and baggage. Do you work here in the building? Yes. My husband's the superintendent. Have you any idea where these people went? No, they didn't say. Well, we're special agents of the FBI. Oh. Here are my credentials. I see. Oh, I wonder if we could look around the apartment, please. Surely. I, I have their key right here. That's fine, thanks. Are the lakes in trouble? Well, this is just an investigation. Go right in. Thank you. Go ahead, Nan. Right. I hope they didn't do anything wrong. They're such a nice old couple. Is this their furniture? No, it belongs to the building. I, I've already cleaned the place up. I don't think you'll find anything. What did they leave behind? Some food and newspapers and waste paper. It's all in a barrel out back. I see. Uh, maybe you'd like to look at it. The other man did. Oh? What other man? A fellow who came here just before you did. He seemed awful anxious to know where the lakes were, too. What'd he look like? Wait a minute, well, Ned. Uh, he... I have a picture of Sutter here. Madam, could you tell me, was this the man? Yes, that's him. Did he find anything in that barrel? Yes, a, a, a travel folder. I don't know what that meant to him. Did you see the folder? Not well enough to tell what place it was from. As soon as he found it, he ran right out of here. He had a cab waiting outside. Did you by any chance hear him tell the driver where to go? Yes, I did. He said the Central Hotel. Mm -hmm. Ned, it's pretty apparent that this old couple had beaten Sutter at his own game. They took that $5,000 from his account and run out of town. And Sutter figures that travel folder will lead him to them. That's about it. Let's get a complete description of Mr. and Mrs. Lake, then we'll drive right over to the Central Hotel. What happened, Jim? I just checked with the hotel clerk. Yes? I showed him Sutter's picture. He recognized it all right. Good. Is he in his room? No. Oh, checked out half an hour ago. Oh, what a break. Mm -hmm. Wait. Uh, how about checking the travel desk? Sutter might I have... just talked to them, Ned. He didn't get any transportation from them. If that old couple had a travel folder, they're probably heading for a resort. Yes, I know. But there are plenty of resorts. If we'd only got... Hold it. Huh? Ned, I've got an idea. Come on. Emmy. Uh, yes, dear? Uh, can we take a little walk around the grounds? Well, I think you've had enough exercise for the day. Uh, we're going right to the cottage now. I'm not tired. Well, you certainly should be. Four games of shuffleboard. And I enjoyed it. Oh, and I was very proud of you, dear. That man you beat was less than half your age. Oh, I was just lucky. That's all. Well, I called for some tea and cookies while you were playing. The hotel is sending them over. Oh, good. Go ahead, dear. Oh, thank you. Good afternoon. Hmm? Uh, Mr. Sutter. Surprise? Uh, why, well, yes. What are you doing here? Well, I went to your apartment and found the travel folder you threw away advertising this hotel. Oh. Then I called here to see if you'd made a reservation. When I found out that you'd taken this cottage, I took the next plane. Well, that was a very sneaky thing to do. You know why I'm here, of course. Uh, vacation? No, money. I want my $5,000. Well, now, look. Now, uh, now I... just a minute, Paul. I'll handle this. Uh, Mr. Sutter, we are not giving you back that money. Oh, no? No. 
And if you don't like my attitude, you you can call in the police. I'm not that stupid. Well, then how else are you going to prove that it's yours? By taking it away from you. Mr. Stuffer, you can't... Hold oh, everything, Stutter. Oh, what? Oh, yes. Oh, are you the young man with the tea? No, ma'am. I'm from the FBI. Huh? FBI? F- goodness, well, what are you doing here? I followed Sutter. How'd you know I'd be here? I knew that you were looking for this old couple. I also learned that you found a travel folder that told you where they were. So I went to your hotel. Their record showed that before you checked out, you'd made a long-distance call here to Las Vegas. So I took a plane right up. Well, this certainly was a short vacation. Oh, I think I can arrange for a long one. For all of you. George Sutter, the bad check passer, and his erstwhile confederates, Paul and Emmy Lake, were tried for their many crimes in a federal court. They were all sentenced to long terms in the penitentiary. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI was closed not only because of the superior investigative work on the part of a special agent, but also because of the aid he received from two sections of FBI headquarters in Washington. The first of those sections is the laboratory, which is filled with skilled technicians all working towards scientifically exterminating the criminal. Their work with iodine fumes brought out the latent fingerprints on a check. And from there, the prints went to the identification section, a section which checks 20,000 sets of fingerprints every day for local police departments throughout the nation. There is no question but that the thousands of special agents throughout the country form a network of infinitely skilled specialists. But it is equally true that their task is made immeasurably easier because of the work the Washington headquarters does for them. For them, and thus for you, the American people. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. A little while ago, I gave you a few brief facts about the Independent 60s plan of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. To get full information, you'll want to ask your Equitable Society representative questions like these. Exactly how much will the plan cost me? The Equitable Man has the answer. How will it dovetail with my Social Security? He's got the answer to that, too. What income will it give me in my 60s? Your Equitable Society representative will give you the exact figure. Ask him to drop around tomorrow for a friendly visit. Find him in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Innocent Thief. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another exciting story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Innocent Thief, on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is 
your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Were you born between 1900 and 1910? Then here's a question you've probably asked yourself more than once. Will I be alive in 1975? Well, just think of all the advances in medical science since you first saw the light of day. Sulfur drugs, insulin, and dozens of others. Since 1910, there's been a 68% increase in the proportion of people over 65 years of age in this country. With this percentage growing greater all the time, there certainly is a very good chance that you will be alive in 75. And in exactly 14 minutes, we'll have a suggestion which will show you how life insurance, with the Equitable Life Assurance Society, can help you make the most of this long life that's ahead of you. Tonight's FBI file, The Innocent Thief. Nineteen forty-seven has not yet run through a quarter of its allotted number of months, but already there is evidence that the number of spectacular crimes in the nation is on the rise. A community fund is stolen from a strongbox in the Midwest. A schoolgirl is kidnapped from her home in the West. A bank in Virginia is robbed for the first time in its sixty-five year history. There's no end to the recital, but the pace of the crime wave is quickening. A major crime is committed somewhere in the United States every 21 seconds. And in the course of those crimes, innocent people are involved. Innocent people who are used as pawns by the criminals. That is why the crime wave is a problem belonging not only to your FBI, but also to you. Tonight's file opens in a roadhouse located in the outskirts of a large eastern city. It is after midnight. For the past half hour, a floor show has been in progress. Sonny Everett, master of ceremonies, is just bringing it to a close. Well, folks, that about concludes our little show. But before I leave, I must tell you about a funny thing that happened to me on the way to the club tonight. Oh, will you hear this? It'll kill you. A fella came up to me and said, can you spare something for a cup of coffee? I said, sorry, Mac, all I have is ten pennies. He says, that's okay, buddy. I'll buy drip coffee. Well, folks, I could keep you screaming like this for hours, but right now, everybody dance. Well, May? Huh? What'd you think of it? Oh, Steve. What'd you think of this show? You really want me to tell you? Bad, huh? Awful. I'm gonna murder that agent. What a routine he gave me. He said that MC was the greatest performer since Lou Parker. Huh. Look at him, heading right for the bar. That's where he performs best. He's been Forget drunk. Forget him, Steve. But honey, Forget he... a load at table 27. Huh? Guy with the two dames. Oh. Look at that jewelry. Wow. Yeah, real heavy. Thought you might have overlooked it. As a matter of fact, I did. That's what that comedian is doing to me. Look, the guy's calling for his check. Uh-uh. Where's Vinny? Over there with the blonde. Oh. Ben. Ben. <laughs> he hates to walk out on that. <laughs> yeah. Do you want me, Steve? Yeah. Uh, take a gander at table 27. Huh? Oh, the, the skinny guy with the two old tomatoes? That's right. Hey, look at the ice they're packing. Huh? I want you to look at it. When they leave here, I want you to be right behind them. Walker, let's yeah. have another round here, will you? Look, Sonny, we got to close up. Don't you want a nightcap? No, thanks. Then bring a drink for me and May. No, none for me, Sonny. <laughs> well, just so nobody's offended, I'll have one. Okay, but this is positively the finish. I got some news for you, kid. I was finished the day I opened in this joint. Chaser. 
Here you are. Thanks. May? Yeah? Yeah. Mind if I call you May? No. Say, what's your boyfriend Steve got against me? He just doesn't like your act. What? He doesn't think you're funny. Who does he think he is? The guy that's paying you. <laughs> In the dark, he's paying me. I took the biggest cut of my life to work this dump. Well, that'll certainly teach me a lesson. Well, settle it with him, will you? Yeah, there's plenty I've got to settle with him. Billing, for one thing. I was writing my contract. Stop billing. And look what happens. Look outside. There's dancing, liquor, steaks, French fried potatoes, and Sonny Everett. <laughs> the least he could have done was coast on me with the French fried potatoes. Hey. Well, hey. it just yeah. shows you one thing. Come here, will you? You okay, work baby. your head off for a guy, get all special material, and what happens? No appreciation. How'd you make out? Come on in the office. Okay. Go ahead. Thanks. May, where's Steve? He went into town. What for? To deposit tonight's receipt. Tell me, how'd you do? Well, take a look. Hey. Yeah. I uh, had some trouble, though. What kind of trouble? Well, I done the job okay, but on the way back here, a state trooper got on my tail. You saw the stick? No, no, I, uh... I was speeding. Well, that was smart. Well, I lost the car. We still could have gotten your license. Yeah, but I didn't use my own car. Who did you use? The comedians. Sonny Everett? Yeah. Where's the car now? Outside in the parking lot. Oh, that trooper's liable to come by here. No matter whose car you use, he could still... Hey, wait a minute. Huh? Wasn't that Sonny Everett out at the bar? Yeah. Why? You stay here. I've got an idea that'll fix the whole thing. In the nearby city, in an FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is also discussing the jewel robbery. I was just about leaving here, Ross, when the report on the robbery came in. And this will be an all-night session for you, huh? Works that way. Mm -hmm. What are the details on the job, Jim? Well, a man and two women were driving home from a roadhouse out on Route 24, a place called the Columbia Inn. Yeah? They came to a lonely intersection, observed the stop sign, a car pulled up beside them. The man jumped out, pointed a gun at them. Was he alone? It appeared that way, yes. He ordered the women to strip off their jewelry. They obeyed. Then he took their car keys and drove away. Well, what was the value of the jewelry? Well, it's estimated between twenty and $25,000. Wow. Uh, could they describe this man? No, he masked his face with a handkerchief. But they did describe his car. Well, what about it? A dark blue or black coupe. The right front fender was smashed. The right door heavily dented. Any further leads on the bandit? Well, a state trooper reported chasing a black coupe in that vicinity. He was after him for speeding. Well, what happened? They lost him when he went across the state line. That's why we were called into the case. Mm -hmm. Did he get the license? Yes, it's being checked now. Oh, excuse me, Russ. Right. Special Agent Taylor. Hello, Mr. Taylor. This is Sergeant Leo, Maywood Police. Oh, yes, Sergeant. You fellas looking for a black coupe? Yes. Right fender and door pretty well banged up? That's right. License number 6N274? 6N274. That's the car, Sergeant. Well, we picked it up in a ditch just outside of town. The driver was still behind the wheel. Injured? No, just drunk. Huh? We're holding him here. Well, thanks, Sergeant. I'll be right out there. Is that you, Steve? Yeah. I'm in here in the office. Okay. Everybody go home? Yeah. Let me get back yet? Uh-huh. You nail that stuff? Yeah. Then, where is he? He went out again. What for? He's trying to be a genius. What are you talking about? After he grabbed the jewels, the cop chased him. He ducked the cop and he came back here. Yeah. But he was afraid that the cop might come here after him. That's where the genius Look, comes in. Well, get to the point, will you? He used Sonny Everett's car for the job. Huh? So he's framing Everett. He's going to make it look like he did it. How? Everett was drunk. Yeah. Then he took him out of here and he's going to leave him in his car by the side of the road. Oh, the stupid... I tried to stop him. Where's the jewelry? He took it with him. What for? Steve, I don't know. Did he say he was coming back here? No, he's going home. Well, I'm going into town and see that guy right now. He's right in here, Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Sergeant. Go right ahead. Thanks. Thanks. 
Everett. <sighs> come on, Everett, wake up. <sighs> come on, come on, wake up. Oh, okay. This man's from the FBI. He wants to ask you some questions. Huh? He wants to ask you some questions. You mean I'm on again? Never mind the comedy. Was well, that funny? Mr. Everett, the police tell me that you maintain you know nothing at all about the jewel robbery. That's right. Yet you were found in the car that was used by the thief. The victims have definitely identified it. I know. That car is registered in your name. That's right. It's, it's mine. That's pretty incriminating evidence. I know. Uh, there's one other factor, Mr. Taylor. Yes, Sergeant? This man is the master of ceremonies at the nightclub the victims attended just before they were robbed. Oh. Huh? Well, Everett, what have you got to say to all this? Oh, the, the same thing I, I've been saying for the last two hours. I, I don't know anything about it. Not a very original answer. Look, all, all I can tell you is this. I, I ain't thinking too good, but I remember being at the club. I, 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 was, I was drinking, drinking a lot. From there on, it's a, it's a blank. Next thing you knew, I, I was picked up in the car. I see. Look, mister, I, I think I can underwrite one thing. The only stuff I ever stole in my life was bows and jokes. I I didn't cop that jewelry. Sergeant. Yeah? You didn't find any trace of the jewelry around the car? No, we didn't. Well, I guess that'll be all for now. Let's go back to your office, Sergeant. Very well. Uh, what, a, what about me? You stay here. Well, gee, can I even call my agent? In just a minute. Well, Mr. Taylor, do you think we should prepare formal charges against Everett? No, I wouldn't yet, Sergeant. Why not? Well, for one thing, I have a feeling the circumstantial evidence against him is too pat. And don't forget, the victims didn't think that he resembled the hold-up man at all. Well, then what'll we do with him? Well, let's find out what time that nightclub opens. I want to take Everett out there and see if we can find anything that'll help prove his innocence. Who is it? Me, Steve. Oh. Come on in, Steve. Okay. I, uh, was just going to go to bed. You got the stuff? The ice? Yeah. Sure. It's right here. Let me see. Yeah, yeah. Oh, not bad. Yeah. Look at the rocks in that pin, huh? Mm-hmm. Stuff must be worth 20 G's easy. Maid tells me you had trouble. Yeah. I want to hear about it. Well, I, I got in a little jam, but by some real smart thinking, I got out again. You mean by framing the act? That's right. Pretty clever, huh? <laughs> you don't think you'll get away with it, do you? Why not? The guy was blind drunk. Lots of drunks remember things. He's liable to be singing to the cops right now. What can he tell them? That you planted him in the car. Oh, who'd believe that? The cop. My word is as good as his. But your record ain't. You made a real sucker move, didn't you? And you uh, think I ought to blow town or something? No. What else, then? I got that all figured out. Well, wherever you go, you're liable to be picked up. And knowing you, Vinny, if you're picked up, you're liable to talk. Oh, you're crazy. And if you talk, that gets me in trouble. Now, look, Steve. This is the only way to settle it. Now, wait a minute, Steve. Thanks for being stupid. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI helps provide security for your country. Now, let's talk briefly about another kind of security. Security for those who want to be independent as they grow older. Okay, Mr. Cross, sounds swell, but I'm no rich man. What with taxes and high prices, I haven't saved a cent. So how can I afford to do anything about being independent 20 years from now? You'd be surprised what you can do. In the Equitable Society are thousands of men earning no more than you do, and they're looking forward to complete independence in their 60s through an Equitable Life Assurance Society Independent 60s plan. Well, if that's a fact, I'd like to hear some more about this plan. The Independent 60s plan of the Equitable Life Assurance Society has these three features. 
First, it costs considerably less than you probably think, especially if you're covered by Social Security. Second, you can create your retirement estate for the full amount the moment you sign the contract. You don't spend years wondering whether or not you're going to accumulate enough money to be independent in your 60s. You're sure of it because it's guaranteed by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Third, this equitable plan gives you a definite goal and provides you with a practical method for reaching that goal. Yes, there's nothing finer than being independent in your 60s, being your own boss. Say, this is beginning to interest me a lot. Well, then get in touch with an Equitable Life Assurance Society representative. He'll give you the facts on the Independent 60s plan and let you make up your own mind. Look in your phone book for the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Innocent Thief. To escape just punishment, the average criminal will offer anyone as a sacrifice to the law. His friend, his benefactor, or his mother. All that's important to the criminal is that he escapes detection. Because to the criminal, there's really only one crime he can commit. And that crime is getting caught. His very livelihood depends on his taking what does not belong to him. And the selfish instinct, the wild greed that drives him to commit the crimes he does, also drives him to attempt to escape blame by sacrificing an innocent person's good name. So your FBI advises you never to meddle with criminals. And when you find a criminal, do your duty and call your local police department. You owe that to your fellow Americans and to yourself. <laughs> Our FBI file continues. Twelve hours have elapsed. Special Agent Jim Taylor and Sonny Everett, the innocent suspect, have gone out to the Columbia Inn. They're just entering the owner's office. Sit down, fellas. Thank you. Mr. Harrison, where's May? Oh, she'll be right in. Mr. Harrison, you already know about the holdup. Yeah, I read about it in the papers. Well, then I suppose you know the police are holding Everett here as a suspect. Yeah, that's tough. You looking for me, Steve? Uh, come on in, May. Close the door. Okay. This is, this is Mr. Taylor. He's from the FBI. Oh, hello. You know? And you know Sonny, of course. Yeah, sure. Hiya, May. The suspect in a hold-up, he's oh. trying to clear himself. He thought maybe you could help him. I'm glad to. How, Sonny? Well, May, I'm trying to piece together what I did last night. When I was first arrested, I couldn't remember anything. Parts of it have come back. Maybe you can fill me in on the rest. Well, I'll try, Sonny. Well, after the last show, I started drinking. Then Steve here went out. That I remember good. Uh-huh. Then you came along. I was talking to you and the bartender. That's right. Then Vinny came in. Huh? He called you back here. You talked a while. And then he came out and took me to my car. Oh, wait a minute. That ain't so. But I remember. Vinny left here early. He never did come back. When you went out, Sonny, you went out alone. But May, I know Vinny was here. Look, who was drinking? You or me? Well, where is this man, Vinny? Perhaps we can talk to him and get his version. Well, he won't be in tonight. He works here, doesn't he? And that's right, but he called a while ago and said he was taking a few days off, uh, going out of town. Mr. Taylor, I bet anything that guy's trying to duck out. Of what? Of being nailed for the robbery. Ah, oh, just a minute, He's son. the guy that framed Hold me. Hold it, Everett. Know... Let me handle this, please. Mr. Harrison, did Vinny say where he was going? Well, no, he didn't. Well, we'll just have to wait until he returns. But he's liable That'll to be... be all for now. Thank you both for your cooperation. <laughs> Special Agent Scott. Hello, Ross. Jim Taylor. Oh, hello, Jim. How'd you make out of the roadhouse? The owner and his girl tried their best to implicate Everett. They wouldn't back up his story? No, not a bit. Well, what about this man Vinny Everett talked about? He wasn't there. He presumably has gone out of town. I see. I talked to a parking lot attendant, however. 
He said he saw Vinny Carey Everett out to his car last night. Everett couldn't even walk. Well, that certainly should prove his innocence. Yes. Well, have you any idea where this Vinny can be found? Well, Everett knows where he lives. We're going over there now. <laughs> Oh, come on in. How's business? Fair. Yeah, it's the weather, I guess. If you're looking for an excuse, you can blame it on that. Honey, rainy nights, you never... Look, let's face it. This ain't exactly a gold mine. Yeah, that's right. Well, why do we hang on to it? For the suckers we promote. That score last night wasn't bad. It wasn't good either. What do you mean? Well, gee, you had to kill Vinny to come out even. That was his fault. That don't make no difference. Look, Steve, let's get out of this, huh? How? Well, you taking those jewels to the friendship? No, I was going over there now. Well, look, if the payoff is good, we can take the dough, go away, and give this joint back to the Indians. Vinny can't be home, Mr. Taylor. Even my audience couldn't sleep through that. Well, then I'd better try this key. You think it's all right? Oh, I picked up a search warrant on the way over here. I mean, do you think that the key will fit? Oh. That should answer your question. Come on. All right. It's a very small scatter. I, uh, I've been here before. Everett, were you and Vinny friendly? <laughs> Are you kidding did you ever catch my act? No, oh, I'm afraid I haven't. Well, the routine is roughly like this. I open with a few fast topicals, segue into a patter tune, then I do my imitations. Now, ordinarily, Mr. Taylor, if the audience uh, Everett, is just a... Uh, you were going to tell me whether you were friendly with Vinny. Well, I was coming to that. Oh. An act like mine, and what do you think a bum like that Vinny does? Sleeps through the imitations. Then you weren't very friendly. Friendly? Jackie Gleason has got a routine about guys like him. Now, his opening Wait joke a starts a... Huh? Come here. Look in this drawer. What is it? Women's purses, two of them. Well, what about them? Well, judging by this card, I'd say they completely exonerate you. How? Here's the name of one of the women who was held up. This is her purse. Then Vinny did do the job. Yes, and he... Well, hold it. Hey, what's with the Jolson? With the what? Down on one knee. Oh. I'm just examining this spot on the floor. Well... Been scrubbed with water, but around the edges it looks suspiciously like blood stains. What? Yes. I couldn't say for sure until it's analyzed, but I've seen enough of it in the past. Hey, do you think Vinny was knocked off or something? Well, that'd be quite logical. Everett, did Vinny smoke cigars? No. Why? It's one here in this ashtray. Steve was the only guy who used them. Oh? Any idea what kind he smoked? Some fancy Cuban kind. He was always flashing them. Hey, look at this band. Would this be it? Yeah. Yeah, that's what he smoked. Look, Mr. Taylor, catch me up on this. I'm about 20 lanes behind you. Well, up to now, of course, it's all conjecture. But putting all the elements together, it's highly possible that Vinny was murdered. Huh? And it's also a pretty good guess that Steve is the one who killed him. So that's it. Where's the body? Well, I imagine Steve would be clever enough to make sure that was cleverly disposed of. Then how can you prove Vinny was murdered? Well, without a corpse, it's just about impossible. But I would... Wait a minute. Huh? I've got an idea, and it might work. Everett, is that really a good act you do? Oh, now, look. You're going to get a chance to prove it. Hi, honey. Well, I thought you'd never get back. What's wrong? Nothing. I was just worrying about you carrying all that jewelry. There's so many thieves around. Don't ever worry about me. Did you see the fence? Yeah. What do you offer you? Eight thousand. For all that? Well, you said it ain't worth much more than twenty. I thought this was going to be a real big score. Well, uh, maybe it's just as well. Why? I've been thinking over that going away deal. Yeah? It'd be the wrong move to make right now. Our best bet is to stay here until the heat's on. Oh, no. Now, look, honey, that's what we're doing. Oh. I'll get it. Well? Is that you, May? Yeah? This is Vinny, May. Huh? I said this is Vinny. No. I just called to see how things were going out there. 
can't be. I just wanted to find out. No. What's the matter? That was Vinny. What? Vinny! No, Look, man. I know his voice. You told me he was dead. That's right. But he just talked to me. Honey, believe me, I killed the guy. I took his body and buried it right out in the back of the joint. Thanks. Huh? FBI? You heard his statement, Sergeant? Yes, sir, I did. What is this? I understand you thought Sonny Everett did a very bad act. Well, his impersonation of your late friend Vinny on the phone just now was good enough to send you to the chair for murder. Steve Harrison was turned over to local authorities who tried and convicted him on the charge of first-degree murder. May, his girlfriend, was prosecuted for complicity in the jewel robbery and sentenced to a long term in prison. Tonight's case in the files of your FBI emphasizes a very important point about the workings of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Of the people arrested last year by your FBI, 97% were convicted when they appeared in court. Your FBI is justifiably proud of that record because it implies a thoroughness in the gathering of evidence. But your FBI is also very proud of the several cases in its files that resemble tonight. Cases in which your FBI not only apprehended the guilty parties, but also lifted the suspicion that had been placed on an innocent victim. For that, too, is part of protecting you, the American people. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. A little while ago, I gave you a few facts about the Independent 60s plan of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. To get full information, ask your Equitable Society representative questions like these. Exactly how much will the plan cost me? The Equitable Man has the answer. How will it dovetail with my Social Security? He's got the answer to that, too. What income will it give me in my 60s? Your Equitable Society representative will give you the exact figure. Ask him to drop around tomorrow for a friendly visit. Find him in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Divorced Child. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI. is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Divorced Child, on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.